for in one hour is thy judgment come. Babylon falls quickly. Things can change very, very rapidly. See, if I end up running from the Lamb when He reappears, something has gone terribly wrong in my life. The Messiah not only has to fulfill all those Old Testament prophecies, not only does He have to die in the exact year that Daniel chapter 9 says, but He also has to accept the guilt of every human sin right before He dies and then die within that 24-hour period. I will pay the penalty and I will die that same day. God never forces the mind. So first Jesus prayed that those who follow him would be separated from the world based on what this book says right here. So God has his sign and the devil has his mark or his sign of authority. And it's up to us to decide which way we will go. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you once again. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> Rose got a little slippery, didn't they, in the last few minutes. Our topic tonight is uh, escape, how to prepare for Satan's final deception. So this is going to be a Bible study tonight. I hope you have a Bible with you. If not, scoot real close to the person beside you and uh, look at their Bible. And we're going to dive into... Matthew chapter 24 and also the book of Revelation as we look at some of the deceptions that the Bible says we should be prepared for as we approach Christ's second coming. I'm going to start with a story. Some of you might remember this. Uh, this was in the 1990s, a guy named Marshall Applewhite. And um, he had had kind of a checkered history in and out of different churches and so forth. He eventually developed this group called the Heaven's Gate, became known as the Heaven's Gate Cult. And in 1997, I believe it was, a comet hale Bop flew by. And, uh, you know, when a comet goes by Earth and you can see it, it usually generates a lot of news for a few weeks or months. It was no different with this one. And... Um, a very tragic story that unfolded. Uh, this group developed this idea with uh, Mr. Applewhite's leading that there was a spaceship that was flying somewhere in the shadow of Comet Hale Bob. And they believed that their escape out of this world would be to get on that spaceship of aliens. And so what did they do? Well, they all put on white robes and they committed mass suicide on the night before this comet flew by. And um, a couple days later, you know, they were found. And what a tragic ending to a very mistaken belief, right? Great deception. Now, this is not the only type of story like this that emerges. And every time something like this happens, people ask a very good question. And that question is, how could people be so easily deceived, right? How could you believe one person with a strange idea like this and end up doing something as terrible as killing yourself in hopes that your spirit would go join a spaceship. Well, tonight we're going to look at something that Jesus talks about, and that is deception in connection with the second coming. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 when his disciples had asked him, what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ." And shall deceive, what does it say? Just a few people? We'll deceive some people. We'll deceive only the short people with red hair. No, the Bible says that many people will be deceived. In fact, Jesus says later in this chapter that the deceptions will be so strong and so subtle and so powerful that even the elect, right? Even those that love God and are trying to serve him will be at risk of being deceived. And I believe we've got a room full here of people that want to be the elect, right? We don't want to be deceived. We want to understand. We want to make the right decisions. So here's our first question. What will be the deceptions prior to Jesus Christ's return? Now, I told you this is a Bible study, so I hope that you've got a Bible nearby. You can follow along. Most of these texts will be on the screen, but I always like to see it for myself, right? Something about seeing it right in front of you. So... Here's what Jesus says, Matthew chapter 24. This is the first category 
of deception that the Bible warns us about in connection with the final events right before Jesus returns. And that is false signs and wonders. So Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive whom? The very elect, right? So there's that verse that I was just referring to. Now, it's interesting. If you go online, you can find lists of self-proclaimed messiahs and Christs. And um, there's a number of lists. I didn't bother to put anything on the screen. But if you go to Wikipedia and look at the article there, it's, it's interesting. They start in the 1700s uh, or 1800s, and there was one or two a century. And that was true until about 1900. And then in the 20th century, the number just skyrocketed. And um, <clears throat> so far, we're on track this century after the first 23, 22 or so years to, to exceed even what happened last century. So this is one of the signs that Jesus warned about is false Christs, false messiahs. And we're certainly seeing an increase in uh, these people that are claiming to be Jesus. But let's focus here on the false signs and the false wonders that uh, Jesus warns about. The book of Revelation warns us about the same thing. If you've got your Bible, let's flip over to Revelation chapter 13. And we'll just look at a verse or two that talks about the same thing. Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now keep coming, because we will identify this prophetic entity later on. We won't worry with that tonight. But we are going to look at what this, this power does. Verse 12 goes on, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And in the Bible, to worship can also mean to serve. So it doesn't just mean falling down, you know, or some external sign of worship that we might think of. This means, who do you obey? So how does he succeed in getting virtually all of earth to serve or worship uh, in this way? Verse 13 goes on. He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Now just think about this. As human beings, we are really geared toward what we bring in through our senses, aren't we? If we see it with our eyes, if we hear it with our ears, if we can in some way experience it through our senses, then we, we believe it's real, right? And this will be one of the primary ways that people are deceived at the end of time. They will rely on their senses rather than relying on something that God says. And uh, this is something that takes practice, right? Learning how to trust in the Bible rather than what my eyes are telling me must be true. It's a great challenge for each one of us. So what are the tests the Bible tests, uh, at least one of them, of the signs and wonders. You know, how can we not be deceived here? Here's what Moses told the Israelites many, many centuries before Jesus. He said, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proves you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So this issue of <clears throat> prophets or other people working signs and wonders, it's not a new issue, is it? This has been going on for a long, long time. And Moses was warning the Israelites thousands of years ago how to deal with these kinds of deceptions. Now there's one more verse, and, and here is the key that we want to focus on. How can we not be deceived by what we bring in through our senses? Here's what Moses says. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep what? His keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. Interesting word there, cleaving. That's the same word that the Bible uses to describe marriage there in Genesis chapter 2, that Adam and Eve would cling to or cleave to one another. 
And God wants a personal relationship with each one of us, doesn't he? And he wants a close personal relationship with us. And he wants that relationship to grow each day and to become stronger and stronger to the point where we know we can trust him, even if our life is at stake. You think of all these figures through Bible history, like Daniel and his three friends, um, Noah, Moses himself, right? Each one of them, they didn't just, they weren't born with that kind of trust, were they? They had to grow into it and they had to spend time with God. And so it's not just about keeping his commandments. It's not just about an external checklist, right? It's about a relationship with God that is manifested in loving obedience to him. So how can we not be deceived by signs and wonders? At least one critically important way here is by reading for ourselves what the Bible says and then making a decision. I'm going to follow this book. I'm going to follow God right here. Okay, here is another category of deceptions that the Bible tells us to be aware of. We just read this verse, Revelation 13, verse 13. And he, that's this beast of the earth, he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, you'd be pretty impressed if you saw that happen, right? And this is one of the signs and wonders. So we're going to zero in. Signs and wonders is kind of a big category. We're going to focus in now. And remember that Revelation is written in symbols. So, yeah, there might be literal fire falling from heaven at some point here between now and when Jesus comes, but it's also a symbol. So what does the symbol represent? We need to think about stories in the Bible where fire falls from heaven. And there's several of them. One of the big ones in the Old Testament is the prophet Elijah. Remember this story? He marches into King Ahab's throne room one day, and he says, it's not going to rain until I say so by the authority of God. And he turns around and gets out of there. That was a very smart thing to do because Ahab spends the next three years trying to find Elijah and kill him. God provides for Elijah, even though the rain stops and Israel starts suffering a terrible famine. And then one day, God tells Elijah, go and find Ahab once again. And so he does. And if you know the story that Elijah says, bring all the Israelites, all the false prophets of Baal and so forth. We're going to go up on Mount Carmel and we're going to have a showdown, right? We're going to see if Baal is the true God or if the God of heaven is the true God. And so the prophets of Baal build their altar and they spend all day dancing around that altar, calling on the name of Baal, uh, trying to wake up their God, right? To uh, bring fire from heaven and burn up the sacrifice. Nothing happens. And then Elijah rebuilds the altar of Jehovah, which is lying and laid in ruins. And he drenches that altar with lots of water. And then he just kneels down and he prays a simple prayer, doesn't he? And God answers that prayer with fire and fire comes from heaven. And there's a great revival that breaks out. That's an Old Testament story. There's a New Testament story where fire comes down from heaven. And that's on the day of Pentecost. 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the disciples are gathered in the upper room in obedience to Jesus. He had told them, wait there in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit is poured out upon you. And so they're doing this obediently. Jesus has returned to heaven, but they're praying and asking for this blessing. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends upon them, and it's manifested in visible flames or tongues of fire. And there is a great revival that breaks out. Peter and the others start, they stand up and they start preaching in different languages. People are convicted. And by the end of the day, 3,000 people have joined the church. That'd be a pretty incredible revival, wouldn't it? I don't know what the population of Montrose is, but if we added 3,000 tomorrow, that'd be a sizable chunk of this city, wouldn't it? What What an amazing experience. So... When fire comes down from heaven in the book of Revelation, it's really talking about a false revival because God is not sending this fire. If you read the whole context of Revelation 13, it's Satan and his agents here on earth that are bringing about this false revival. So that should lead us to a question. What brings on true revival, right? As we move closer to Christ's second coming, we can expect more and more counterfeit or false revivals. What 
makes a true revival. And we'll let the Bible answer this question. It's interesting, when you look through the Old Testament stories, especially of revival and reformation among God's people, there is always one consistent common denominator. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. So God pulls Israel out of Egypt. Moses leads them out of Egypt. He leads them to the base of Mount Sinai. And here's what we read, Exodus 24, verse 7. He took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. And they meant every word of it. Now we know the story. They weren't successful, right? (laughs) But at this point, they had a true revival. They really did want to serve God. What was it that led them to that conclusion? Moses read from the book of the covenant, right? He read from the word of God. Move forward to Elijah's day. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go and show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Did Elijah just wake up one morning and say, I'm kind of tired of this famine stuff. I think I'll go see Ahab again. I don't think so. God spoke to him. He told him what to do. Now, how does God speak to us today most of the time? It's through the Bible once again. Let's look at a couple more stories. King Josiah, again, decades down the road, one of the greatest revivals. In fact, the Bible says it's the greatest reformation that ever took place in Israel. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. They were looking through the temple, which had essentially sat vacant and in ruins for years and years, and they found this book, and they realized this is the book of the law that Moses had written by God's instruction. And so they start reading it again, and a great revival and reformation breaks out. Are you seeing a common denominator? Just a couple more examples. Ezra, after the Jews come back from their captivity, and all the people spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. Again, it's the word of God that brings reformation. Here's the last one, Nehemiah. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day. And another fourth part, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. No one was worried about leaving at noon that day, were they? That was a revival service. And the people were willing to stand there. If you actually read it, I believe the Bible says it was raining at the time too. And here the people are willingly standing outside in this stuff that's happening right now because they want to hear the word of God. And they realize they need this and it's feeding them what they need. So true revival, there are other elements. The Holy Spirit brings true revival. True revival comes as a result of prayer, but you cannot leave out the word of God. If the Bible is not being studied, if it's not being preached, if there's not call for biblical living, biblical repentance, you can't have true revival. So it's a pretty clear, simple test, isn't it? Let's look at another category of deceptions that the Bible warns us about. This one is found in Revelation 16, verse 13. Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. False prophetic messages. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, this is a fascinating passage. We're going to look at the verse that follows in just a moment and we'll see what effect these false prophetic messages have. But let's think for just a moment Uh, about who is it or what is it that brings these messages. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Now, it's interesting. A few chapters earlier in Revelation chapter 14, God sends a true prophetic message, and it's three angels flying, flying over the earth in the heavens. So here is a counterfeit of the three angels with God's message. These are three frogs. And maybe you've wondered if you've read this verse before, why is it frogs? You know, there's a lot of animals that could have been chosen. And uh, I have an idea why God chose this animal. The house that we used to live in was out in the country, and we had to put in a sewage lagoon. In Missouri, we call them potty ponds. But um, 
<clears throat> in the summer, you know what kind of animals like to hang out around that kind of water? Well, frogs, right? And they get, I mean, the dirtier and the nastier that water is, the more excited they get. And God is trying to tell us, I believe, that these prophetic messages that come from the frogs, it's really a sewage message, right? To put it as sanitarily as possible. Why would you listen to frogs when you can listen to angels, right? Why would you listen to this message when you can listen to something that angels have to say? So here is a deceptive prophetic message, and it ends up uniting the world together. We'll look at that in just a minute. So how can you know what a true prophetic message is? Again, here's what Moses says, Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Once again, the Bible's the test, right? The word of God is the test. And if there is a message by some self-proclaimed prophet or even somebody that many people believe is a prophet, if the message they are teaching and preaching does not match with the Bible, then you know very easily, very clearly, this is a froggy message. This is not a heavenly message. Don't listen to the froggy message. Now, here's the next verse, and this is the next category of deception, or you could say this is one of the results of the false prophetic messages, and that is false religious unity. So again, verse 14 of Revelation 16 says, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So the Bible tells us that the world is going to have a sense or a type of unity at the end, right? All the kings of the world and everybody else. So that includes the religious powers, that includes the economic powers, that includes the political powers of this earth. Everything is going to be united, at least for a short time. In Revelation chapter 17, we actually read this verse on night number one, but it'd be good to review it right now. Revelation 17 Verses 12 and 13. Revelation 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings for one hour with the beast. Now, some people look at that one hour and they, they work out prophetically with uh, prophetic time, which we'll dive into tomorrow night. Um, some people believe that's 15 days, and it might be. It'd be great if it only lasted that long. But uh, even if it's not exactly 15 days, it's a short time. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us. What happens for this short time? Verse 13, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And what happens when they do that? Look at the next verse, verse 14. These shall make war with the lamb, but the lamb shall overcome them. That's Jesus. So there's good news there, isn't there? Amen. So what about this? False religious unity. Now, first of all, the Bible does tell us very clearly that as Christians, we are, we are to do all that we can to live at peace with other people, right? Whether they're Christians or not. You know, Paul wrote in Romans, I'm paraphrasing, but do your best to live with all men peaceably. So that is definitely part of the Bible's injunction to us. But living peaceably with your neighbors isn't necessarily the same thing as uniting with them together, right? There is a difference there. So we're not talking about, are you nice to people? We're talking about, are you uniting, are you uniting together, uniting your interests and whatever else? That's what we're looking at. And it's interesting as we look at what, hap what is happening today, we see lots of pictures like this, right? And it seems to be happening more and more frequently where you have religious leaders from all around the world, all different faith traditions, whether it's Christian or Islam or Judaism or all of the other religions that are out there, they're getting together more and more often, and they, they often do it in front of the camera so you can see this visible unity that's going on. Perhaps you've heard about this set of three buildings that is supposed to be completed this year over in Abu Dhabi, the Abrahamic family house. One of them is a mosque, another one is a synagogue, and the other one is a church. And they're all on the same campus here. And you, you can see they almost look identical to each other. There's just slight variances in the architecture. 
But the idea is that all of the monotheistic faiths need to come together. Um, you know, we all do have Abraham as a common figure back there. Uh, does that mean that we start worshiping together and that we start discarding all the beliefs that might separate us just so we can have a visible unity? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Now, Jesus did pray for his disciples, and that means us today. He did pray that we would have unity. Here's what he said in John 17, verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So that's us. That they may all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So Jesus did pray for unity, right? But he actually prayed for something else first. And this first part of his prayer, this other part of his prayer, is one that you don't hear people talking about an awful lot today. But if you don't have what he prayed first, you can never have the true unity that we just saw in this verse. So what did Jesus pray about a few verses before? <clears throat> verses 14 and 17. Praying about his disciples, he said, I have given them what? Thy word, right here. And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is the truth. So first Jesus prayed that those who follow him would be separated from the world based on what this book says right here. And he knew that that would happen. It's an uh, inescapable result of following the Bible, of following Jesus. You will be separated and divided from other people. That's just part of it, as long as we live on this world, until he comes. And he prays first that his disciples would recognize that his word is truth, that they would be willing to take a stand on that, that they would be willing to surrender or give up whatever it might mean to follow God and his word. And then he prayed. He said, really, this, that second prayer is the promised result. When his people take that stand on his word, then they will have true unity with each other. It's a promise. But we can't skip the first part, can we? And expect the second part. Here's another great category of end time deception. And that is communicating with the dead. The Bible is very, very clear. And it has been all the way through from the earliest books of the Bible that we should not attempt uh, to communicate with the dead or believe that the dead can communicate with us. Again, Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 18, says this, Thou shalt, There shall not be found among you anyone that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Right? I mean, he... Not a lot to quibble with in that verse. God is very, very clear that trying to communicate with the dead or believing that communication is possible puts us on very, very dangerous ground. Now, it's interesting. During the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, there were some news stories that started popping up to the effect that uh, a lot of people were having what they believed was experiences with departed loved ones, a lot of them that had died during the pandemic. So headlines like this, they lost their loved ones to COVID, then they heard from them again. And just a couple sentences from this article, this was on CNN. There is another group of pandemic survivors who say they have been granted a second chance to say goodbye. They are, pe they are people who believe they've been contacted by a loved one who died from coronavirus. And whenever there is a massive tragedy, such as a pandemic, a war, or a natural disaster, there is a corresponding surge in reports of people seeing the dead or trying to contact them. Interesting. Here's another story. This was from November 2018. The number of witches is rising dramatically across the United States as millennials reject Christianity. Now, it's, it's no secret that Christianity as a whole is struggling in Western countries, United States included. And where are all these people going that are not joining the church, especially the young ones? Well, the Wiccan religion and other pagan religions are growing very, very rapidly. So in 2000 or in the 1990s, there were an estimated 8,000 Wiccans here in the United States. 
And in 2018, they estimate there's 1.5 million. That is an exponential increase in uh, the number of people that are doing this. Witchcraft and pagan religious practices increased in the U.S. over the past few decades, with millennials turning to alternatives, ranging from astrology and tarot cards and away from Christianity and traditionally dominant Abrahamic religions. With 1.5 million potential practicing witches across the U.S., rich, witchcraft has more followers than the 1.4 million mainline members of the Presbyterian Church. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, how does God communicate with us? You know, the Bible addresses this point again very, very clearly. Isaiah said, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19, When they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, and that mutter should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So even on this point, the Bible brings us back to the same foundation that we've been seeing in all these deceptions, right? It's the word of God. This is what will test all the experiences we have, whether it's a miracle that we see with our eyes or we hear with our ears or an apparition that looks like a lost loved one, whatever it may be. We've got to test everything with the Word of God. Now, here's another one, and this is the last counterfeit we'll look at tonight. Satan's counterfeit of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus promised that he's going to come back. And so Christians for 2,000 years now have been looking forward to this event, and for good reason, right? It's the only way out of this mess <laughs> here on this world. We should expect that Satan is going to do his best to counterfeit this as well. In fact, the Bible tells us very clearly that he will. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. And Satan would love for us to just think that he's this little short red-footed beast, right, with the little pitchfork and the ears that go like that. As long as he can get people to think that that's what the devil looks like, that's the enemy then that opens the door for him to do all kinds of deceptions, appearing as an angel of light. Now, <clears throat> I got to thinking about this, and so I started looking at the actors that have played Jesus over the past decades. And you tell me if they all look basically the same. Okay, so I'll have to keep the screen up here. I can't tell you the names of all these movies. These are obviously from a while ago. They all look pretty much the same, don't they? Uh, fairly tall, blue eyes. I don't know why he always has blue eyes. I'm not sure how many Jews have blue eyes, but Jesus often has blue eyes in the movies. And uh, shortcut beard, shoulder length hair, nice chiseled cheekbones, right? Here's another set, also from movies. Basically, same look, right? And here's three more. Again, Jesus always looks the same, no matter what actor is playing him, no matter what production company is making the movie, no matter what continent the movie is made on. You can even, I think some of these are from India and Bollywood and places like this. Jesus still looks the same. Why is this? Seems a little strange to me. Even really old images of Jesus. So on the right side here, this, I believe this is from uh, an Orthodox church somewhere. And in the middle, you recognize that, right? That's the shout of Turin. And it's not too much of a stretch to basically see the same face there as well. And um, even sacrilegious Jesus's. It's the same look, isn't it? Now, why is that? The Bible tells us that before Jesus comes back, Satan is going to counterfeit Jesus. He's going to look like an angel of light. Could it be that the devil is priming the pump, so to speak? And we are so visually oriented in the world today. If I see it, it must be true. Could it be that he is programming humanity to think that this is what Jesus has to look like? And how much easier would it be for him to pull off a great deception at some point before Jesus comes? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 says, then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And the context of this passage is what happens right before Jesus comes. 
even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, why will so many people end up being taken by this last great deception? Here's the next and last verse or verses. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It comes back to the Bible, doesn't it? The Bible gives us everything we need to recognize the deception, even if a shining, obviously supernatural being shows up someday and begins walking up and down on earth and maybe even performing miracles, maybe even saying some of the same things that Jesus said. Somewhere there will be a lie. Somewhere there will be a teaching that does not match what the Bible says. That's why it's critically important that you know the Bible for yourself, that each of us is studying the Word of God and learning how to trust God and take Him at His Word. So how does the Bible describe Jesus Christ's return? We're going to finish here with a few verses that describe the real second coming. And um, we, want to, we have to understand, we need to understand what the true second coming is like so that we're not taken by one of those deceptions. So here's the first thing we're told. The second coming will be very visible, right? Every eye will see him. Revelation 1 verse 7 tells us this. Jesus had warned about this. He said, if someone tells you that I've come back out in the desert or up in your ray, or tell your eye, don't go, right? Everybody is going to know when Jesus comes back. Every eye will see him. Jesus said, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we're not looking for a secret event that only a few people experience or know about. We are looking for an event that everyone on earth will see. Secondly, the second coming will be loud. It'll be a very audible event. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 31, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. I'm a trumpet player, so I like this verse. It doesn't say with the sound of an oboe or even a violin and no offense to those of you that play other instruments, but there's a reason it says trumpet, right? Trumpets are loud. In fact, they were used historically on the battlefield to direct troops and to warn of, you know, approaching danger. I remember once uh, my trumpet teacher that I had for years sent me a YouTube clip of him playing a trumpet solo with the community band. And I don't know how many people were in the band, but it was a concert band. So, you know, 60, 70 people. And he made a point. He told me in the email he sent, I'm standing up in the middle. You'll see me. And I want you to know that I do not have a microphone on the trumpet. And then he made the point to tell me, but most of the rest of the uh, band, they were mic'd, you know. And so I, listened, I watched the YouTube video, and sure enough, when he stood up, and it was a big, loud, jazzy-type piece, but you could hear that trumpet out and above every other instrument, even though he had no microphone and the rest of the group was being amplified. And he was very proud of that fact. There's a reason that the Bible says... It will sound like a trumpet when Jesus comes back because everybody living on earth, in fact, even the dead, will hear this trumpet. It, it's going to be loud enough to wake the dead. It will also be a very glorious event, won't it? Jesus says, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. So how many of the angels in heaven will be with Jesus? Jesus said all of them. Now, what impact did one or two angels have on resurrection morning? Think of all those Roman guards around the tomb. What impact did that one angel have as he rolled the stone away? They were all like dead men, weren't they? Can you imagine how glorious it will be when every angel in heaven is with Jesus and all of that glory? We can't imagine it, can we? You won't miss it. Again, this is not a secret, hidden event that somebody has to tell you, hey, here's the video, go watch it. No, you'll know when Jesus comes back. 
We are told that the second coming will also be destructive. Jesus, or uh, Revelation says, as the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So if you don't see it, if you don't hear it, you're going to feel it, right? Because there are going to be earthquakes like we've never had, at least since the flood. We talked about that last night, didn't we? <clears throat> the second coming will be very, very joyous. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Lots of reasons to be joyous in this verse, aren't there? The dead are raised. You'll be re reunited with, with your family members and your friends that have been separated by death. And as you go to hug them, you realize, my back is no longer sore, right? You have a new body. And you'll never have aches and pains again. And never have to worry about death or taxes, those two things. Yeah. <clears throat> no more. And finally, the second coming is a final event. Jesus says in Revelation 22, verse 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Some people come away with the idea that if you miss the first time, if you miss the second coming, then there's another chance somewhere down the road. And Jesus makes it very clear in this verse, right? When he comes back, when you see him, when you hear him, when all that glory appears, he will have his reward with him. And um, we want a good reward, don't we? We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And Jesus has promised that each one of us can hear that. If we develop a relationship with him, if we make a decision right now, I'm going to read and study this book, and I'm going to order my life after it with God's help. And even if it means losing things in my life or facing the risk of death itself, <clears throat> with the help of God, I am not going to disobey my Savior. If you make that choice every day, you can't be lost. And you can be guaranteed you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. It's good advice, isn't it? My prayer for each one of us here and everyone that is watching this is that we can each be ready and we can be ready every single day. Now, before we start with the new questions, I have to make a correction from our last meeting. We were talking about the flood, and somebody asked a question about the timing of the flood. Do we know when it happened? And uh, I said it was about 4500 BC, and someone uh, thankfully corrected me afterwards and said, I think you meant 4,500 years ago from now, which is what I meant. So we don't know exactly what year the flood was, but if you work out the Bible chronologies, it was around 2,500 B.C., which would have been 4,500 years ago. So just wanted to make that correction. Okay, let's take a look here. So uh, thank you for all of the questions. It says, uh, what are some of the biggest pitfalls that keep us from desiring and reading God's Word? Hmm, yeah, that's an important question. Let's turn to Matthew 24. I think Jesus addresses this in this same chapter that we've been looking at. Jesus um, says in Matthew 24, verse 37, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, what were the days of Noah like? Jesus goes on to explain some of the pitfalls that kept those people from being ready to accept Noah's message. It says, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. Now, it's not wrong to eat <laughs> and it's not wrong to drink certain kinds of things. <laughs> and it's not wrong to get married and to enjoy your family. That's not what Jesus is saying, right? The point that he's trying to make is people were so caught up in their life and in the daily round of earning money and spending money and going here and doing this, they simply didn't have time to sit down and process what Noah was trying to tell them and warn them about. 
Now, can you identify, <laughs> is that any danger that we might have today? We all face this, don't we? We get so caught up in the busyness of life that we just don't take the time to really look at what God's trying to tell us. I think that's the biggest danger. Boy, that, that's a great answer. And that goes along with that parable too, where uh, he has to go into the highways and the byways because one person is uh, going yeah. to, oh, I don't remember all the things, buying a cow and another one was going to a funeral. or Burying their father. Yeah, yeah exactly. They were all busy. And, and uh, that's, that's one of the sneakiest ways, the things that steals uh, us, uh, or steals our time from, from reading the Bible. That's a great answer. Okay, next one says, doesn't the Bible say that Jesus will not touch the ground when he returns? Yeah, so let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, little book buried there in the middle of the New Testament. But it's got a long name, so it's pretty easy to find. Chapter 4. And we'll read a few verses. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the Bible is very clear that when Jesus comes back at the second coming, when that great resurrection takes place, uh, we will be caught up to meet him in the clouds. Um, again, this is why Jesus says, if someone tells you that, that you know, Christ has come back and he's in the desert or in the closet or anywhere else walking here on earth, right away you can know it's not true because Jesus is going to be up there and he's going to bring us up to where he is. Fantastic. Very good. Hopefully I'll be able to get this one all right. It says, so with the counterfeit of the devil, when he disguises himself as the Lord, is it going to be hard to know the difference? Uh, this, uh, this part terrifies me. Uh, how do you really know? And then the last part says, meaning, uh, meaning that he... Not come in heaven night. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I think we got the, the, the general gist of it. Yeah. So uh, one thing to understand about Bible prophecy, and, and this will become more clear as we keep studying together, okay. is that... I did get this last part. Of it. Okay. So it says, meaning he did not come uh, from heaven, right? Something like that. Okay. <clears throat> so one of the keys of understanding Bible prophecy is that the Bible interprets itself. And to really understand the full picture of these prophecies, and this one included about the counterfeit of Christ returning, you have to read the prophecies together. Now, the context of that counterfeit of Christ's return when Satan appears as Christ and mimics Jesus is <clears throat> right before Jesus comes back. And there are a lot of things happening on earth at that time. 2 Thessalonians, which was the major passage we read from, where it talks about that wicked being revealed and then destroyed by the brightness of his coming, that tells us part of the picture. The other part of the picture that we need is in Revelation chapter 13, which tells us why does Satan appear and uh, counterfeit Jesus. The reason that he does this is to try to get people to receive the mark of the beast. And we will, uh, in a couple of weeks, we will spend an entire night on the mark of the beast. And you'll see very clearly right from the Bible what that's all about. And um, <clears throat> by the grace of God, you'll have no questions what the mark of the beast is. So we're not going to explain that right now. But when you read through Revelation 13, and we read these verses tonight, this is verse 13. He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire, uh, maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. The final um, piece in the string of miracles will be Satan impersonating Christ. Why does he do it? It's to try to deceive people into receiving the mark of the beast. So, in spite of all the miracles that he might be doing, or all of the really nice words that might be said, Somewhere buried in there, you can count on it without a doubt that there will be a false teaching that <clears throat> the mark of the beast explains and reveals. 
So you need to keep coming, okay? We're going we're gonna to study, we're going to understand the mark of the beast, and when you know that, you'll know what this false Christ is going to be teaching. Okay, fantastic. Does the Bible say when Jesus will return? No. Here's what Jesus says, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So we can't know exactly when, but Jesus did say that you can know when it is near. Just a few verses before, this is verse 32, Jesus says this, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. And I think what we were just looking at tonight with all of these deceptions going on, these are all happening in the world today, aren't they? And they're increasing uh, rapidly. These should be signs to us that Jesus is near, even at the door. Very good. Okay, will, will Satan counterfeit the rapture? <clears throat> yeah, there's several parts to that question. Um, and part of it, you know, there are different ideas of what the rapture means. The, the word rapture itself really just refers to the re, uh, turn of Christ, or a parousia is one of those Greek words there, and it just means appearing. And we just read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it talks about when Jesus appears, he will, in a sense, rapture his people up to him. Okay, that's one sense of the rapture. Um, you know, I don't know on this question if... if you know, the person is thinking of what's sometimes called the secret rapture, where, you know, the pilot of the plane disappears, and it's just the clothes there and the hat sitting on the, the seat. The Bible doesn't really talk about that kind of mysterious secret rapture that nobody knows is coming. It does talk a lot about the visible return of Christ, which is what we focused on tonight. Um, and yes, Satan will counterfeit that. We looked at those verses as well. Yeah, that's good. And in a sense, <clears throat> the rapture is, as you're studying in Scripture, it's, it's associated with the resurrection, yeah. which, of course, is something that Satan won't be able to... He can't do that. <laughs> uh, ...impersonate or, yeah. or, or deceive in that area. So, yeah, the graves are popping open and people are coming out. It's a pretty good sign. This is the real deal. <laughs> <laughs> it's the real deal. <laughs> yeah. uh, will Jesus rescue us before or after the tribulation? <clears throat> Did God rescue Jesus from trial? Or did Jesus have to go through a great time of trouble? How about the disciples? They had to go through it too. How about Daniel and his friends? Did God prevent them from facing any dangerous situations? He didn't, did he? You can look all through the Bible. And while there are many, many promises that God will be with you through trouble, or ultimately save you through trouble, whether it's by miraculously preserving your life or raising you in that resurrection. We have lots of promises about that, <clears throat> but you will not find a, a single promise in the Bible where Jesus says, follow me and you'll never have to worry about trouble or persecution. You just don't find it. So <clears throat> uh, I forget how the question was worded, but no, uh, we're not promised. <laughs> that Jesus comes back before there's any trouble that we might face or tribulation, but he does promise us that he will save his people through it. Amen. Amen. Don't know if you've put much thought into this, but this is an interesting question. It says, how can every eye see Jesus coming at the same time since the world is round? I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, I believe what he says. Every eye will see him. And... Um, Good. I can't go beyond that. I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. It says, why does God allow deception? If he is love, wouldn't he prevent lies? Hmm. You ever wonder that maybe? Why would he do that? <clears throat> Someone saying, test our hearts. You know, how do I really know if I love God until I'm in a situation where I'm really tested or tempted? to not serve him, or I'm faced with something that really makes me dive in deeper. I think <clears throat> probably many of us have been through experiences in our life 
where we start asking questions. Is this real? You know, and <clears throat> hopefully that will drive you deeper into the word of God and into a deeper relationship with him. If we allow those kinds of experiences or questions that are thrown at us to bring us closer to him and closer to the word, then we actually end up stronger than we were before. And, uh, you know, one of the symbols that Jesus uses for this process is, is metal or gold going through the fire, right? Getting rid of the dross and coming out stronger than it was before. Um, the other reason that he allows these things is because he values freedom of choice. And um, God is love. The Bible is very clear about that. But when we really understand what love is, it's freedom. And it's freedom to choose to serve God or freedom to turn our back and do our own thing. And so God can't just, you know, coddle us through life in a, in a styrofoam ball so that nothing ever hurts us or threatens us. That's, that's not reality. That's not love.